Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast, coming up. And one of these, we got out by about two kilometres and it, it went from sort of 20 knots of wind to sort of 45, 50 knots of wind. Uh, and, and very quickly that builds the sea up to sort of two metres, it's breaking. Um, you've got spin drift, these little tornadoes coming past you. Um, and uh, that, that feel, feels pretty extreme when, when you're in the boat. On today's show, we have an adventurer and kayak extraordinaire. Will has done some remarkable things over the years, from kayaking around the fjords of Patagonia to Norway. He has seen some spectacular things, and today on the podcast, we talk about some of those incredible adventures. I am delighted to introduce Will to the show. Thanks very much for having me, man. Uh, Good to be on. Well, absolute pleasure. I've been really interested to sort of learn a bit more about your stories and adventures. I I sort of came across you recently and I have to say your kayaking trips, the photography and film that you do is spectacular. And I absolutely, I'm really intrigued to sort of get into your stories about Patagonia and Norway and your story in Scotland as well. But let's start with how you got into this kayaking adventures? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky, actually. So where, where I live is uh, a small town, it's Ullapool, in the far northwest of Scotland. Uh, the bottom of my garden was the sea growing up. Um, and I, ironically, I, I grew up in dinghy sailing. My dad's really into his sailing. Uh, and spent most of my time sailing dinghies around the loch. Um, and ironically, I've become a really rubbish sailor, but... On a sort of side note of that, I ended up getting into paddling and, and sort of really dove into that pretty full on. And so I suppose being up in Scotland, you were always growing up as a kid, you had the sort of outdoors to really express yourself. What was it about kayaking that you sort of took such a keen interest in? So for me, it, it was kind of, I've always loved playing in water. Um, initially, for me, kayaking, I started as a whitewater paddler more than a sea kayaker, which I tend to do more of nowadays. Uh, and it was, it was simply because there was someone a little bit older than me uh, at school who we, we all thought was quite cool. Uh, and he was, wi- he was willing to take me and my, my best mate out in, in river boats and just chuck us off stuff. Uh, I probably spent more time swimming than I did paddling. And, and he would pick us up at the bottom and sort of wait, right, try it this time. Uh, try not to do that this time. Oh, that was good. <laughs> try that. Um, and then sea kayaking didn't really come until later, uh, seriously, uh, after, after university. Uh, and for me, I really love that ability in a sea kayak to go very far, very remote, but pack relatively comfortable things. If, if you go for a week, you can pack nice food and you can pack sort of comforts. Um, if you're going more minimal like you would for hiking, you can you can go for a month or more uh, and get all that stuff in a boat. Good. And so your first, well, I, as I said earlier, you know, you've done these incredible trips in sort of Patagonia and Norway with some of the, I suppose being in a kayak, you also, you can go to these sort of remote beaches, which are so hard to sort of get to. What was it about Patagonia which sort of inspired you to do your kayaking trip there? Uh, so Patagonia is the most amazing place. It's, for me, kind of like uh, Scotland on steroids a little bit. Um, it's, the mountains are a little bit bigger. The wilderness is just a little bit wilder. Uh, the weather is fierce out there. It's famously very windy. Um, as a sea kayaker, that's probably your worst enemy is wind. Uh, and if you combine all those challenges, it makes a really alluring place to go and paddle. As an expedition, I actually went down there first uh, as a guide uh, and sort of cut my teeth in, in kayak guiding for the first time in, in Patagonia. And it was two seasons there where, you, you, as a guide, you're basically going around the same river. Uh, or you're in sea kayaks, but we were, we were on a river system. And you would go round and round and round, always looking at the mountains that you knew behind uh, thousands of miles of, of fjord that basically no one can get to unless you've got a boat. Uh, and that is really alluring to go and sort of know what's on the other side of those mountains. 
and so the the end of the second season that was the the kind of the kickoff point to go and start doing these big expeditions out there was was that kind of curiosity to see what lay beyond those uh, and to go and explore it by kayak so were you doing that alone no so i have done a few trips alone in, in patagonia uh, none more than three or four days uh, the navy there basically are the the sort of the key holder to the fjords and the sea and the rivers unlike in the uk or, or in, in a lot of europe anything you do in chile on the water needs naval permission um, that's largely because they're your free rescue service and it is incredibly difficult for them to rescue you in a lot of these places and so it, it takes months of preparation to go through and get these permissions to go there and one of those step ends is is no solo trips uh, you do have to have a partner uh, and so my best friend uh, from, from the north, Seamus Nairn, comes down uh, and he, he normally flies down at the end of my season and joins me uh, and we go off and, and do these sort of big long trips together. Uh, and so how, how was it? What, um, how did it sort of all start? Were you sort of weaving in and around the sort of fjords of Patagonia or was it very much a sort of uh a route of which sort of a historic route that someone's taken that you wanted to follow so a little bit of both actually the the route itself has got not any significance in a sort of the route we chose however parts of that followed on with some of the the original native tribes um portages uh, now the the tribes out there the Kueskar, um the the, uh, the yaman they they were the people that Tierra del Fuego got its name from, um, the land of fire. It was their fires on the beaches that the, the early explorers saw and named it the land of fire. Uh, and these, these people were incredible. They, they lived basically naked in the equivalent of a Scottish winter. So this, this sort of rain and wind and it's, it's sort of plus minus five degrees. And they, they survived by putting seal fat on themselves and, and lighting a fire in their canoes uh, on, a, on a bed of clay and navigating these fjords. And they, they would portage between the, the rough sections where you could. Uh, and so our route included some of these to, to add in. in. In terms of our actual route choice, it's, it's a linear journey that we've been doing now over two expeditions. Uh, we're going to hopefully finish it off with a third that we, we had to cancel last year. Uh, that's basically gone from the north to the south through the fjords um, and not in the most linear way uh, taking detours here and there to go and see the, the the big glaciers that are tucked in the back of some of these fjords um, which is what you really want to see because the glaciers are very yeah. impressive so did you uh did you dabble in seal fat did you strip off and yeah do, good, do... good bit of butter butter <laughs> on there keeps it keeps it nice and clean um no, I mean we we did we did eat a lot of butter though. Uh, so ev every day you're you're eating sort of half a kilo of butter in your in your meals, which is obscene. Um, but yeah, no, definitely not. Um, the the seals there are big and scary, and you don't really want to go anywhere near them. Uh, in fact, I can show you here the, as a comparison. Um, this is a Scottish seal tooth uh, for those who can see on camera. Uh, you wouldn't um, want that, that going through you. No, so that that's a Scottish one. Um, that's that's the the Magellanic fur seal. So they're, there's they're quite fairly, a significant fairly difference meaty, <laughs> yeah um and if you think how big our seals are they're, they're big old creatures they're, i mean what is that a couple really of inch tooth yeah it must be what two and a half three inches oh, um, yeah it's big enough um, good and so i mean we had katie on episode 20 and she was talking about her trip of patagonia which she sort of said there's such a famous sort of quote and I, I, I'll probably absolutely butcher it but it was something like the scenery is taken from heaven and the wind's taken from hell or something along those lines yeah. I can't remember yeah, exactly what it was landscape from heaven landscape from heaven carved from the winds of hell I think you, you see it on a lot of brochures <laughs> down there <laughs> I mean it, it's true I mean it is it's hellish weather but the, the landscape is heavenly yeah, yeah. No, I mean, some of your photography, because you're a very talented photographer, and some of the sea shots that you've got are absolutely incredible. I mean, certainly makes me want to whip out the brochure and plan an expedition down there. 
yeah, I mean, we're really lucky to be able to get to these places. And the, I mean, the, what you don't see behind those amazing shots is the many, many days of not particularly amazing weather. Um, but Patagonia is one of these places you can basically point a camera anywhere and you're <laughs> going to get something pretty decent. It's a, yeah, it's a very photogenic place. Yeah. So how long was that expedition? So the, the, first, the first of those expeditions through the fjords was 33 days. We, we packed for 45. Um, because of that hellish wind and weather, you, you don't know if you're going to get caught in one of these mega storms where you just cannot get out on the water safely. Um, and you're talking kind of 50, 60 mile an hour winds plus uh, on a fairly regular time period. So you're planning quite a bit of extra time. Uh, we got really lucky with the weather on our first one. So we, we shaved 10 days off our planned time. Um, and then the second trip, we, we again, we planned, I think, for about three weeks. And it, it took us 16 days in total. It was, again, a little bit under time, which is what you want. You don't want to end up having a ration on things. I mean, the fact that you can just hold a camera anywhere and capture these sort of spectacular moments. Were there any sort of moments along the way which you can look back and think, wow, that particular moment is just something that you can sort of cherish for the rest of your life yeah for sure that i mean there's some of the days particularly on the first trip we uh she seamus nairn his, his last name we, we've called this this effect the nairn effect in that for seamus this was his, it was his first ever expedition this first trip we did and we had three kind of jewel in the crown points so amazing glaciers and every single time we had horrible weather between them. And when you arrived at these jewels in the crown, it suddenly the wind dropped and the sun came out and it was just glorious. And the, the middle fjord particularly, we were as remote as you can get, uh, sort of over 350, 400 K from the nearest road. And just glaciers everywhere, perfect weather uh, and just glorious paddling. Uh, and that, that sort of memory and, and feeling of remoteness, I think we'll cherish for the rest of my life. Oh, wow, God. Yeah. I mean, being in lockdown in the UK is certainly one for the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose with the sort of terrible weather and uh, sort of very, with the challenging weather conditions, there must have been some times, were there a few sort of hairy moments along the way where you were like, Phew. There's, there's definitely a few that caught us out a little bit. Um, again, with the wind being, being the, the key one there. Um, we, we only really got caught out once, um, which was on a crossing. There's a few big open crossings that we had to commit to. Uh, and you take it really seriously. There's no proper weather forecasting out there. So when you get to these crossings that are going to take you an hour or two to get over, you look at the clouds and the mountains all around you and you sort of say, OK, what are they doing? Does it look like the weather's going to change? Uh, do I feel safe? Where am I going to blow if things go wrong? Um, and one of these, we got out by about two kilometers and it, it went from sort of 20 knots of wind to sort of 45, 50 knots of wind. Uh, and, and very quickly that builds the sea up to sort of two meters. It's breaking. Um, you've got spin drift, these little tornadoes coming past you. Um, and that, that feel, feels pretty extreme when, when you're in the boat. Um, it's interesting as well because those waves as a kayaker uh, as a sort of an experienced paddler two meters is not big for a wave it feels big uh, but it's very manageable but with those winds what you end up with is a very steep two meters and it, it caps off at the top and then from that capping off at the top the wind is blowing you hellishly sideways and so you're, you're more bracing and steering and just trying to keep the boat on track. Uh, thankfully, that wind was behind us, which was nice. Um, and it just launches you down into the fjords. Um, we, we basically got blown across this, this big open crossing uh, and thankfully found shelter in the islands behind. So. God, that must have been such a relief to sort of get into those shelters away from the sort of storm. Yeah, it gives, it gives your mind a lot of time to rest as, as much as the body. Um, and it, it's always funny because it, we, you could see this storm coming as soon as it, it started to build. We, we got out and you suddenly saw this wall of wind coming and you thought, ah, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then suddenly, yeah, sort of going, right, we've got to get to that point, which at this point was about a 40 minute paddle away. Uh, and as soon as you get in there, it is a bit of a like, right, let's stop and have a chocolate bar. That was... <laughs> That's a relief now. Because <laughs> I imagine you're sort of there weighing up. You're sort of like, is it going to move? Is it not? And then suddenly you're like, right, let's go for it. And because 
in sort of mountainous conditions, the weather can change so quickly. Probably, yeah, as you say, after sort of 20, 30 minutes, you're like, bugger. <laughs> yeah, and you're, ah, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, actually, Patagonia, apart from being sort of high in, in mountains, it's the only place I've ever seen weather change that quickly. Uh, I mean, it can literally go from sunshine and no wind to snowing and sort of 20, 30 knots in, in less than a minute. Uh, and it's amazing how those sort of fronts suddenly go bang and they're just on. Um, it's a very digital wind and it can sort of go bang and stop as well, which you'd hope for when it happens. So your plan is to go back there? Yes. So... The, like I say, we've done two trips so far, linking sort of start to finish of each trip. So we, we're doing this very long linear journey through. Uh, and, and we could do it very quickly, but the idea is to sort of take your time and really see what's out there. Uh, and we had one planned. We're less than a week away from executing it, in fact, last March. Uh, almost, actually, uh, tomorrow would, would be a year ago today um, that we, we suddenly... Suddenly, sort of said, uh, yeah, that's not going to happen and we've got to go home and isolate now. Uh, and and I, I was in Chile at that point. Oh, wow. Um, and we, we were hoping to link up another 850 kilometer journey uh, south through the Strait of Magellan uh, into the Beagle Channel through one of these Quest Car portages uh, and then proceed down and round Cape Horn uh, and come back again, um, which would have been a, a real fun adventure. Uh, one, one we still hope to do as well. Yeah, when when it all quietens down in a few, well, hopefully yeah, a few months. Yeah, yeah. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Yeah, we're, yeah. It, it seems it seems we're over the hump. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I suppose uh, people are probably listening, wondering, you know, would you would you recommend this sort of trip for the average person for a kayaker? For for an average paddler. Probably not, um, unless you've sort of done a couple of other expeditions first um, or have someone in the group that's experienced with, with dealing with those sort of conditions. Uh, for an experienced paddler, I would absolutely recommend it. It's a, a superb trip, um, but it is definitely not one to kind of cut your teeth on as a first expedition uh, because it is a very, very remote place uh, and, and quite demanding. Um, but yeah, if, if you're if you're feeling confident and experienced, it's uh, it's an amazing part of the world uh, and worth the hassle to get the naval permission. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it it just does look one of the most breathtaking places in the world. But as you say, can be quite hospitable at times. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it and it does it does claim people. Um, there's, there's normally a few deaths a year. Yeah. Um, and so from there you came back to Europe and you were sort of pursuing uh, different sort of kayaking trips each year from like Norway to Scotland because your Scotland trip sounds quite interesting. Can you sort of yeah, tell, so the, uh, for people listening, it's probably best you, you sort of describe what the sort of purpose of that Scotland trip was. Yeah, so my, my Scotland trip sort of, uh, Pre precludes the, the Patagonia stuff and that that started uh, when I when I left university I'd done a couple of small on footer expeditions um, overseas in, in Iceland New Zealand uh, and, and had always been asked about my home country and how much can you really say about your home country um, it's uh, for me I could talk very well about a small pocket in the north and very well around the kind of pocket where I was at Stirling University but the rest of the country I really had very little idea about. And so the idea was to, to try and circumnavigate the country uh, by sea kayak and then come north again through the Munro Mountains, which are 282 peaks over 3,000 feet. And the idea was that by coast and mountain and, and cycling between those as I went up, it would cover pretty much everything uh, in Scotland. Um, I now I now realise that there's an awful lot more to cover, but uh, it gave a, it gave a pretty good good sort of taster for sure. Yeah, we had Emily Scott on an episode nine, and she she ran and cycled this sort of 282 Munros. Is that you did? Yeah, she she did it very she did it very quickly. Uh, she did a really good job of that. Yeah, she um, absolutely nailed it. So. Um, and you were sort of doing the same, running up, cycling up all around them yeah 
Yeah, so when the kayaking kind of came first, uh, and of that, I did 21 of the Munros as I passed on the kayak, because they, they're the sort of the logical ones you access by the sea. Um, and then through, uh, by the time I'd finished that, it was September, and so I was coming through the Munros mostly through the winter. And as a result of that, you kind of cycle in with a bike, base camp, and then do circuits of two to four days, going through big rounds of them, and, and come back to the bike. And then cycling to the next sort of base camp and doing another big circuit and, and coming around. Um, and because because I was kind of solo and on my own most of the time, uh, you had to make circuits. You couldn't sort of do linear things. And much much like I think Emily did, she sort of did lots of circuits. Yeah, no, no. She she said it was a really really amazing sort of experience because, as you say, very rarely do you get to appreciate a lot of your own country in such different sort of pockets like every every single place has their own sort of unique quality and with 282 yeah. Munros dotted around scotland you certainly got to experience quite a fair chunk of it yeah i think that there's a certain magic in doing a continual round of Munros. um you get to a summit and if you are lucky enough to have a nice view you're looking at and probably the next 40, 50 mountains you've got to climb, and you're looking back at 40, 50 that you've just climbed. And, and you aren't actually traveling massive distances uh, a lot of the time. So you're kind of doing a few mountains here, and then you're maybe going five miles, and then you're doing the next five mountains or so. So you, you get the same view from many different angles um, while facing this kind of daunting view to the north, going, oh, my goodness, there's loads. And then this very satisfying view to the south, saying, yeah, I've done those now. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's quite a unique feeling. Yeah. And so that Scottish trip, that took what was the good part of a year, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, by complete and utter coincidence, one day short of a year, um, <laughs> which was not planned. Um, it was supposed to take 10 months. Um, the, the kayaking was about the right amount of time that I planned. And then the, the mountains, uh, it was one of the worst recorded winters on record. And that, that really slowed me down. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think we had sort of 12 major storm fronts come through in the space of six months. And it, was, it was pretty brutal. Well, after Patagonia, I don't know what you're complaining about. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> actually, Patagonia compares very well with it. <laughs> it's a logical next step. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I lived up in Scotland for a bit. And yeah, the weather can turn pretty, pretty, yeah, uh, pretty certainly, bad certainly pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, it really can be. Um, Good. And so, and then I suppose you've sort of been doing these sort of kayaking trips just every sort of year or so, going to a new place, experiencing it. I mean, as I was saying earlier, it's such an amazing way to sort of explore the coast of a country. Yeah, it's a really good way to get, I mean, certainly, for example, in Scotland, uh, historically, the coast were the highways, were not a coastal country. Um, before the roads were built, people went by boat. Um, and you get an awful lot of the original culture on the coast. Um, it's, it's very interesting in Scotland, because kind of the further north you go, the more it, it swings out of Gaelic and into Viking stuff. And, and other things that dump into Viking, Viking uh, And you start sort of seeing this sort of intermingling of, of different cultures and, and time and place names. And the and the and that, that's very interesting. And uh, is your sort of uh, intentions just to keep sort of traveling every sort of part of the world with this? Because it's such, as I was saying, it's such an amazing way to explore. And so you could literally just pick a country on the coast and say, right, I'm just going weaving up Norway or yeah, I, Sweden. Or I mean, I could, I, could, I could spend the rest of my life kind of picking, picking random parts of the world. Um, <laughs> I, there's various ones I'd like to go to before I, I fall off this planet. Um, and it would be it'd be nice to get as many as possible. But I, I think for me it's a balance as well because because I run a kayaking business, so I'm I'm paddling most of the summer, uh, and then it's my escape. Ironically, is to go paddling or cycling or hiking, um, and so it's it's kind of trying to go somewhere that's a bit fresh and new and and develops your own your own ability and and sort of horizons a little bit. What sort of tip um, do you have for people uh, who are keen to kayak? What's the one sort of like bit of advice you would give them main thing i would say is not to get too hung up on kit because kayaking is one of those sports that you can buy and spend a lot of money on um 
and you can have fun in a really cheap boat. You do need to get, obviously, the safety stuff, so a kayak, a buoyancy aid, paddles. Um, if you're going on your own, spare paddles, a pump, and I would recommend a helmet as well. Um, but you don't have to buy the sort of thousand pound ones. You can buy relatively cheap things. And as a beginner paddler, I always say if you're practicing, practice with an onshore wind somewhere that's going to blow you into a safe ground, uh, not onto sort of cliffs or rocks or anything. And uh, as long as you stay close in an onshore wind, if you're a decent swimmer and you've got a buoyancy aid on, you'll probably get into shore if you get into trouble. Um, better if you can do something with a club or, or something like that. There's a lot of local clubs who will, will teach you really well as well. Uh, or hire someone like me who will take you out and teach you. It's uh, <laughs> a shameless plug. <laughs> What's the company called? Yeah. Kayak Summer Isles. Um, there we go. Uh, I, so yeah. I have a little confession uh, because our, your trip in Norway, I, a couple of years ago, had planned to do this kayaking trip around Lofoten. And I was very, very envious of uh, when I was doing my research for this to sort of see the sort of beautiful landscapes of Norway and the trip that you had up there. Um, very sort of briefly, I mean, how was it? So I can sort of imagine um, it and pretend like I was there. <laughs> Norway, Norway is basically northern Patagonia. Um, it is amazing the massive fjords it's got i mean similar sort of thing you can point a camera anywhere and it's beautiful anywhere you go it's just wonderful the culture's amazing um seamus actually joined me on that trip as well um and to give a kind of background to this when when we planned norway seamus and i planned norway we planned this in in june uh, june july and that was our big trip was to drive his van up to nordcap kayaker circumnavigation around Nordcap and then go into Lofoten and just explore Lofoten with kayaks for, for a few weeks. Um, on a whim, I then phoned Seamus and said, I'm, I'm planning this big Patagonia trip. Do you want to come down? And he sort of said, all right, um, and, and sort of dropped tools. And that, that Patagonia trip became this big, mega wild adventure. And Norway, which we'd planned and sort of paid for, um, then became almost kind of a post-trip debrief and a, and a bit of a re relax. And we were staying in a, we were sleeping at the back of a van. We weren't in tents. It was pretty relaxed. And you're not going out for months at a time. You're going out for sort of days at a time. Um, and so the the whole mood of that trip for us was very chilled out. And, and although doing sort of interesting things in boats, it was it was kind of very much on our terms. Um, and we we got fortunate with the weather too. It was it was gorgeous up there. Yeah, we, I take it you went in the summer. Yeah, so it was kind of June into July, um, so 24-hour sunlight. And, and in fact, Seamus liked it so much when we, we got to Nordcap, he, he got a job and, <laughs> and stayed there most of the summer. <laughs> Not really surprised. I mean, it, yeah. as, a, as I was sort of saying, and yeah. for anyone listening, it, it is just one, it just looks like one of the most spectacular places. Yeah, I mean, pretty much anywhere in Scandinavia really is, is fantastic. It's, it's just a lovely culture. And the culture generally is very outdoorsy. So, so your, your average sort of out person is, is very capable and equipped for doing stuff in the outdoors. Mm. And, uh, and they love sharing that as well. They're lovely people. Yeah, yeah. Big fan of Scandinavia. Um, well, Will, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Um, with the first being, well, I, I need to quickly now look it up because let's just see. Um, on your trips, what's the one item or gadget that you always bring with you? Um, I'll not include the kind of practical stuff like tents and sleeping bags and things because you need those on all the trips. Um, the one thing that I carry with me that is completely and utterly useless but very important sentimentally yeah. uh, is a compass, which is completely ruined. Yeah, it's, I was going to say, for people my, listening, it's completely broken. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it doesn't point north. Um, there's a large hole in the screen. That was actually from someone's crampon, um, which has a funny story. I lost it on a hill, and somebody found it, and through the power of social media, got it back to me, uh, and he found it attached to the bottom of his crampon. Um, it's from 1914. It was my great-granddad's compass. Um, 
and it, it's kind of been on every adventure I've, I've been on. Oh, amazing. Um, but it, it's heavy and completely useless, but quite good fun to carry about. Okay. Um, what is your favorite adventure or travel book? Favorite travel book? Um, I will start with the one that really got me inspired to do my Scotland trip, which is Blazing Paddles by Brian Wilson. Um, subsequently followed, well, he, that was his, his account of, of kayaking around Scotland, uh, I think in the 80s, late 80s. Um, really one of the first people to ever do so, uh, and long before dry bags and technology and things were really kind of as they are now. Uh, and it's just beautifully written and really kind of captures it. Um, I'd also probably say Moods of Future Joys by Alistair Humphreys, which uh, was kind of the, one of the early travel books that I read that I, I, kind of gave me a sort of a bit of inspiration to go and do things out and around, around the world. Yeah, he, he does come up with some pretty cool stuff now and again. Yeah, and it, it's it's one of those books that it, it captures very well the little bits of expedition, the kind of the, the stuff that's not so interesting to focus on, like routine and... and the kind of small subtleties of things that people comment on and things things happen to you. Um, things that are simpler, sort of getting up and making coffee when you're in a tent and that sort of stuff is, is often overlooked, but it can be a big part of your day when you're that's your routine. Yeah, we when last yeah. the last sort of big trip I did, we always used to wake up, make a cup of tea. God, that sounds so British saying that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Essential. It yeah, essential. essential. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, it certainly yeah, yeah. Uh, wakes you up and starts the starts the day right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, why are adventures important to you? Um, adventures are important to me because I find they they kind of ground you in your surroundings. Um, I, I find going on a longer adventure allows you to really kind of immerse yourself in whatever discipline or place you've decided to be in. Uh, and it it allows your body to slowly adjust and, and react to that. I find if you go in on a short trip, you can see things and you can push yourself to whatever limits you want, but you don't have the time to develop the routine in it that, that sort of embeds you into that adventure. Uh, and that, over time, slowly changes you as a, a person, and, and you, you basically are, are sort of making a new version of yourself in different surroundings, slowly. Um, Oh, that's really nice. I haven't really ever thought of it like that, but it's it's very true. Um, what is your favourite quote or motivational quote? Um, so this this one was is from my dad, uh, and he tells me every time I'm having a hard time on an expedition, uh, which is it's better to be Shackleton than Scott, and basically no one nowhere to call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so it's. Uh, and that's often sort of rung into, into head so that when you're going through a difficult time you go should I proceed or should I stop sit and think about this like it's it's quite often better to, to sort of stop and think yeah um, and better still would be to be Admanson who was successful pretty much throughout his expeditions and um, Shackleton still had some fair epics to be fair um and what who was it Shackleton he said it's better to be uh, a live live donkey than a dead lion Right? Yes, something like yeah, that. Yeah, or something um, along those lines. I probably I, again, I uh, probably just butchered an absolutely another classic quote. Yeah. Uh, the the, mo the modern version is better to be a chicken than a cock when you're doing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, no, that's uh, I always like that one. Um, people listening are always keen to go on these you know, sort of grand adventures around the world. What's the one thing you would recommend for people? wanting to go on big grand adventures um the one thing i recommend for people going on big grand adventures is is to leave it a little bit open to what you actually want to achieve um the best adventures that i've ever ever sort of had were the, often the sort of side things that happened as a result of the initial plan um and sort of not not to get target fixated and i, and I want to go and do this mission because if you're if you're kind of there to do one thing you often forget about all the other things surrounding it and and you don't have the time to enjoy that um and and whatever you do big or small you want to take that that sort of take the blinkers off and, and sort of remember that you're in these amazing places or you're doing something amazing and you should enjoy it for for what it is 
um, even when you're feeling pretty grim about it, if it's if it's hard, uh, it's, it is types of fun. <laughs> yeah, I I agree with that. I was yeah. sort of we were speaking about it the other day. The idea of going quite on an open ended adventure where you don't know too much about what's going to happen. You just sort of take it on a day to day, because sometimes if you're so target focused, as you said, you do miss those little moments, whether it's someone saying, come in for a cup of tea or whether it's come in for dinner or, you know, wanting to stop and chat. If you're so driven and focused, usually you miss those interactions, which end up being the most unique and what makes those expeditions really memorable. Yeah. And um, sort of an example from sort of personal experience was uh, from my Scotland trip being on, on my own. Uh, by the, the end of the kayaking, I got very... Uh, the last few months you get very target fixated when you start seeing a goal um, and I, I got very good at kind of doing distance and just putting head down and, and paddling and of course enjoying your surroundings to a degree but you, you're kind of also sort of making ground as, as priority and that held into the Patagonia trip where Seamus joined and in the first couple of days I kind of went into that and, and recessed back into that mindset of okay we, we've got A to B to do let's, let's do A to B uh, and then Seamus sort of pointed out that actually, no, let's let's go and look in, in those bays and let's see what's around there and, and sort of deviating and slowing down and sort of saying, I, I've never seen a penguin before. Let's go and have a look at that penguin um, and, and stuff like that and, and slowing down per- very purposefully. Yeah. Um, and, and initially for me, I, I found that sort of the first day or so a little frustrating. And then afterwards, I mean, like, oh, no, he is completely right. It's, that's what you're here for. You might as well enjoy it. It's probably never going to be there again. Yeah, I think... Yeah. Um... We were discuss- I was, I think I was discussing with Geordie Stewart and saying, no one really cares how quickly you go unless you're breaking the world record for being the fastest kayak to go around Scotland. No one cares that you put in 100 miles or 80 miles. It's really yeah. just about uh, I mean, your own personal ambition. Yeah, and it's it's kind of your memories and the memories that you can give to other people if you're if you're in a group that are kind of what you want to produce um a record at the end of the day is just a a bit of ego on the wall uh, <laughs> hanging at home <laughs> do you have one of those um, uh i don't officially no <laughs> um, i could probably claim some if i if i hunted through but uh, it's never really bothered me no, no yeah. you do do it for do it for yourself or for a cause yeah yeah, the best. yeah. Um, Will, finally, you know, what are you doing now and how can people find you and follow your adventures in the future? So at the moment, I'm preparing as hard as I can to get my company back up and running, uh, offering kayaking trips in the northwest of Scotland. Uh, if you want to join us, you can find us at kayaksummerisles.com or on Instagram, kayak.summerisles. Um, for my own personal adventures, I'm kind of looking a little bit ahead now to 2023 to do that Cape Horn trip. Uh, and you can follow me on willcopestatemedia.com or at willcopestate on Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing some of you out there if, if you ever come this way. Well, we'll put a link to your Instagram and uh, website on on my website so people can follow you and find you. And um, Will, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing your stories. And as I say, it's fill, been a pleasure, John. Fill yeah. me with a little bit of envy. <laughs> At the, at the moment, like I say, I'm, I'm the same as everyone else, sitting at home, I'm building a shed as my big adventure. So, <laughs> so, so, feel, I feel a bit envious of doing that stuff as well. No, well, very soon we'll, we'll be both be out. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure. Having big adventures. Yeah. But Will, thank you so much for coming on today. Been, been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.